And now launching Friday Nighties Music Nights film season, Michael Parkinson introduces a special tribute to the composer John Barry, recorded at the Royal Albert Hall. Good evening, I'm uh, Michael Parkinson. Welcome to a very, very special evening here tonight with this wonderful venue. We're here tonight to remember and celebrate a great man of music. John Barry's output was monumental, both in quantity and in quality. He wrote pop songs which became standards, film scores which garlanded him with honours, uh, five Oscars indeed. He created music which will last so long as people find pleasure in a glorious melody, a sumptuous arrangement, and in particular, a seemingly intuitive understanding of how to create the perfect union of music and the moving image. It's difficult to imagine any other composer of film music with a catalogue as rich and as varied as John's. So what we have tonight is a feast of music and some memories of a remarkable man from family and friends, those who worked with him and loved him. I first met John way back, early 60s, Granada Television in Manchester. I was working on a nightly magazine programme. The John Barry Seven were guests on our show. In those days, they were just another group taking a ride on the magic roundabout of the 60s. The uh, John Barry Seven was, in fact, the launch pad for an extraordinary career. I found three musicians that I'd been in the army with, and uh, three local musicians in New Yorkshire. So we formed the first Seven. Let's go over to the bandstand where the John Barry Seven are all set to rock and roll their way through a number called "You Got Away." Take it, boys. Pete Murray introducing John on Six Five Special in 1958. You got away, but I need so much. Rock and roll, it was all Gene Vincent and all these, yeah, yeah, well, boy, yeah. And I can, I can, oh, yeah, yeah, no. and, it, and of course it doesn't carry. Right, you want to let me, but I'll let you that way. Well, it's not that I didn't like singing, it's that nobody else liked the way I sang. It was as simple as that. Now, since I met you. It was really uh, not a good idea. So we quickly switched to just doing instrumental stuff. The very beginning of a life in music which we are going to celebrate tonight. And just before the music begins, let me introduce to you John's son, John Patrick Barry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my father's memorial. I'd like to introduce our conductor, Nicholas Dodd. Have a wonderful night.
And this is from John's 1965 film score for The Knack. Very, very long time friend of John Barry, about 45 years, I think. And I'm very sorry, really very sorry, that I, I can't be there tonight, but I have to work and that, that's what I do. I didn't want to offend Batman, do you know what it's like? Um, John and I first met at a very seminal moment of, of my, my life, and we became great friends, and he was a real part of the beginning of my career because he wrote the music to both Zulu and Ipcrest File, which were the sort of makings of me. And at the same time, we became very, very, very close friends. He's one of my closest and oldest friends and, and, and a marvelous guy. So he was not only important to me as a friend, he was important to me personally as a composer and is very, very important as one of the great all-time movie music composers. Many years uh, later, he was doing the Bond films. And um, I, I came to a situation where I, was, uh, I didn't have anywhere to sleep for two weeks. I got wrong lease and the, didn't, the lease didn't start. And so John said, come and stay with me. So I said, great, thank you, John. He had a lovely flat and I went to sleep and I was woken up about an hour later by the piano and John was on the piano and he was on the piano and all night long he was on the piano <laughs> uh, this is my first night there I thought my god I'm gonna be here two weeks I'm never gonna get any sleep he's gonna be on the piano every night and I, um, in the morning I got up I went down for breakfast and he was still on the piano <laughs> and when I went into the room I said you want a cup of tea he said no he said I'll come in he said I finished. I said, I, I, have you finished? He said, yeah, I have. And I said, what were you composing? He said, he said for the Bond film. I said, yeah, he said, yeah, that's right. I knew it was for the Bond film. I said, what, what were you writing last night? He said, this. And he played me Goldfinger. So I was the first person in the world ever to hear Goldfinger. And I heard it all night. <laughs> but I missed John. Whenever I went to America, and he lived in America, I mean, geographically, friendships are difficult, but whenever I went back to America, I saw him. And being here, speaking here tonight, reminds me of the last time I spoke here in the Albert Hall. And it was in a concert tribute to John and his music, and I introduced him. And now I'm here in the same place sort of saying goodbye. 
Have a nice evening. Thank you. Music from the 1964 film Zulu. Now, Nicholas Dodd conducts the orchestra as they play John Barry's music for The Ipcurse File.
The Ipcus File. Next, we'll hear part of John's beautiful score for the 1980 movie which starred Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour, Somewhere in Time. And now John remembers his work on the 1968 movie, The Lion in Winter. We had like a 120-piece orchestra and choir, and a 40-piece choir. And it was a great opportunity for me to do a choral, because I'd started off studying with Dr. Francis Jackson at York Mints, and I studied choral music with him. It's always difficult to assess the potentialities of a pupil, but I was pretty certain with John that he was uh, dedicated enough. Uh, he never said very much, so I couldn't really tell what was going on between those years. It was a, a different teaching ambiance that, than I'd ever, ever experienced before, most certainly. Really? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, well, that's a comfort because... <laughs> After all these years. <laughs> and 
I must say I'm bowled over by the way you write for an orchestra. Mm -hmm. The way you use the horns high mm -hmm. up. Right. In unison. It's, right. It's a wonderful effect. It's very powerful. There's a lovely low flute. Alto flutes, I like. Yes. Alto flutes. But you either use one or four like, to get four alto flutes. Two doesn't sound right. Now here's conductor Nicholas Dodd. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome on stage John's great friend and lyricist, Don Black OBE. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I have been writing songs with uh, John Barry for almost 50 years. But to be honest with you, I remember the lunches more than the songs. <laughs> it's true. When I first met John, I was living in Hackney and writing songs for a then unknown but great singer called Matt Munro. Yes, absolutely. John Barry changed my life with a sentence. He said in that lovely Yorkshire accent of his, he said, do you fancy having a go at writing a thing called Thunderball? <laughs> and that was the sentence that got me out of Hackney. In those days, John was the coolest man on the planet. He drove a white Maserati car, he wore handmade suits, he had this fantastic apartment overlooking the Thames. He was handsome, he was successful. I don't know what all those beautiful women saw in him. <laughs> and John always loved the best of everything. It, it had to be Dom Perignon uh, champagne. It had to be Pollini Montrachet wine. It had to be Delamain brandy. And then he'd have lunch. <laughs> John was not a big eater. But when he did eat, he liked simple food. His favorite dish was fish and chips with a little vinegar on the side. Writing songs with him was an absolute joy and really very easy. He liked uncomplicated, honest lyrics. Nothing fancy, nothing clever. A little bit like his lunches of fish and chips with vinegar on the side. He loved to laugh. His favorite comedians were Tommy Cooper and W.C. Fields. John was a great audience. I remember telling him a joke at Wilton's restaurant, one of his favorite places on German Street. He was absolutely hysterical, and all I said was, uh, John, what's the difference between a Jewish mother and a Rottweiler? He said, what? And I said, eventually, the Rottweiler lets go. <laughs> he, he almost choked on the one chip he did eat. John lived in Oyster Bay and Long Island, and he used to swim in his pool every single morning and always to the music of Mahler's Fifth Symphony. He was obviously a very slow swimmer. <laughs> it's a little musician's joke for the, for the boys here. What really amazed me about John was that just how America never changed him one little bit. He lived there for almost 40 years but he remained a Yorkshireman through and through. Not once did I ever hear him say anything remotely American, like, go figure, or I don't have issues with that, or, or you do the math. He never used words like awesome or closure. No, I always felt that John put the York in New York. John was a very private man, he wasn't the easiest to get to know, but if you knew him, really knew him, you loved him. Unfortunately for John, and for me, and for all of us, outside of the Bond world, you only live once. In 1965, John changed my life again. He said to me, do you fancy putting some words to this? He then played me this simple yet epic melody. You are going to hear it now played by this magnificent orchestra. It's called Born Free. Thank you very much.
And after the Oscar-winning Born Free, harmonica player Julian Jackson makes his way to the stage to play the main theme from another Oscar winner, Midnight Cowboy. Here's John talking about his Oscar-winning score for Dances with Wolves. And Dances with Wolves, I think, it never struck me as being a Western somehow. That it was a story that took place in the West. And I always felt that this, uh, this journey that uh, John Dunbar took to get on a horse and just go West into that landscape and face all that was out there. It was just the most extraordinary adventure. And I tried to, to relate to everything through his eyes. Even, even the grand stuff, if you like, was, was instead of just being grand in cinematic terms because you've got a big scene, let's have a big orchestra, let's just play something big. It was the bigness came out of how he saw big, how he saw that grandeur as he slowly came upon it and it started to, these little hills rolling in front of him, all this, almost like a moonscape. Kevin had a very bright, direct sense of what he wanted. And he just told me more or less about, about what he felt about John Dunbar, about the character. That's more helpful to me than, than anything, that, that insight that he has, having, 
having spent two or three years on the project through the through the script form uh, to directing and performing. So I'd much rather a director tell me all his his inner feelings about a character and let me let me figure out what that musical thing is. John Dunbar's theme from Dances with Wolves. Now here's conductor Nicholas Dodd. It is a privilege to me to be conducting and celebrating John's music with you tonight alongside the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and our other talented guests. A few years ago, John accorded me the great honor of handing me his baton just before a concert of his music in Paris. It was done quietly, no fuss, but with strength. And I feel it's these qualities that flow through his music that help to make it simply timeless. They say behind every great man is a great woman. And in John's case, Laurie Barry is that great woman. So, so really, perhaps tonight is as much a celebration of them as it is of him. So this next piece, We Have All the Time in the World, was sung by one of John's heroes, Louis Armstrong. And to sing it tonight, please welcome one of the country's finest new talents, Rumour. Time enough 
And as the audience and orchestra take a break for the interval, Neil Rosser talks to some of the artists backstage at tonight's concert. So, David from Luton. Yes. <laughs> David Arnold. From Luton with love. Oh, tonight of all nights, yeah, yeah, it's nice. Everywhere seems exotic if you come from Luton. <laughs> so yeah, Albert Hall, amazing. David, tell me about Shaken and Stirred. Shaken and Stirred was a record that I made and started making in 1995, and it came out in 1997, and it was kind of born from a love of John Barry's music and his songs specifically for the James Bond films. I saw my first one when I was eight years old, which is you only live twice, and I was kind of knocked sideways by the way it looked. The music, you know, the, the James Bond theme, it had the song You Only Live Twice and Nancy Sinatra and it had all those fabulous John themes in it. Again, you know, coming from Luton and seeing it in Luton when, when you're an eight-year-old boy, you'd think like, well, I could, you know, quite fancy some of that. That looks amazing. And I kind of hooked from that point on. Yeah. Um, and I had a little bit of success with a film called Stargate and then people who normally perhaps wouldn't return your calls started returning your calls because yeah. you know you'd done something which had done a bit of business and and I had this idea about doing some of John's songs and a couple of other people's songs from Bond films with people that I like to yeah. you yeah. know to make a record because I grew up with records as much as I did with cinema so that's kind of where that idea came from. Did that not lead you to a commission to actually write the music for the James Bond movies? Well, I'm not sure if it was directly responsible for it. It was probably a part of it because I think it was a combination of that record coming out and being well received and also kind of pointing its way towards perhaps this is a way that James Bond music could be, you know, it's mm. a different way of doing it. That alongside the fact that Independence Day came out at the same time and was the biggest grossing film of the year that year. And so I think it was a combination of, A, they knew I was hugely enthusiastic about James Bond yeah, and John yeah. Barry's music. I can handle a big movie and I'd already effectively written a couple of cues in the some of the arrangements for Shaken and Stirred but the truth of the matter that Barbara Broccoli told me that I have no reason to doubt her was that she was in a record shop looking for CDs of composers to audition for the job of doing the music for James Bond and the guy behind the counter said that you should listen to me you know yeah, and so yeah. Barbara told me that that was why he stuck Shaken and Stirred in her hand and a couple of CDs and and that was that. So somewhere there is someone who works at our price <laughs> who I owe a very large drink to or a very small house. Fantastic story. And you went on to write, is it five? Five, I've done five now, yeah. Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, Die Another Day, Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace. Five is a fair old amount. It's been extraordinary and you, know, you work with amazing people. And the great thing about it is that you do feel like you're adopted into this family. You know, the Broccolis and you know, Eon Productions, they're hugely respectful of everyone that they work with and, and they do make you mm. feel appreciated and wanted and kind of looked after. Did John Barry become a friend? He did, yeah. I met him actually when we were doing the Shake and Stirred record and we spent a couple of hours just talking about music and things that we like and he started this relationship that we had which kind of ended up with me going out for dinner with him and listening to these incredible stories, mm. you know, we didn't really talk about music all that often, but the things that he did and the people that he met and the stories that he had to tell were, you know, completely unrepeatable and probably, I hate it when probably, tell you yeah, yeah, probably <laughs> actionable, but you know, amazing. I don't think he ever really changed. You know, he was always this very down to earth kind of straightforward sort of Yorkshireman who just happened to write, like for me, you know, the best film music ever. Darren Watkins, we're here in this smelly old room in the bowels of the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> we certainly are, yes. <laughs> how, did the, uh, how did the rehearsal go? It went very well, actually. I got sent the part a couple of days back to play um, Remembering Chet, which um, I actually wasn't that familiar with. Yes, we had a rehearsal at the Henry Wood Hall, I think it was last night, and then just came in and played it through once today. I was actually I was very pleased at the end of it when I came off Laurie was there, John's widow, and said, oh, Derek, that was exactly what John had in really? mind, how to play oh. it, and you are John Barry, you've been with him since 1965, and he's spoken highly of you, and now I realise 
exactly why he used you on all the Bond films and everything. So, yeah, so I was really chuffed with that. It was, it was very do. pleasing That's to have... Thing to say. have yeah, so to have appreciation from, from the family is lovely. Yeah. Very, very yeah. nice. Did you play on all of the Bond movies? Yes, scores? right, yes. That's an extraordinary yes. feat, isn't it's it? It's 21 or 22 now. I've 22, lost count. Yeah, isn't it, I think. The next yeah, my very f I just did my very first session was Doctor No. That was 1962. And I was just subbing for, it might have been Eddie Blair or Ezard or Kenny Baker. Somebody couldn't make one session. Really? So I'm counting that as the film. So you you know, but, wow. uh, and even the last lot that we're doing, which, uh, I mean, Dave Arnold and Nick Dodds are fantastic. That's Nick Dodds, the conductor. Right? Yes, and Nick has orchestrated, and Dave has written the last few, like from Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace and before that. And uh, they've updated it with modern rhythm section, feel or whatever. But they're such a fan of John Barry and his music that they've kept the essence of Bond through all that. And because they wanted the same sound, they've got in touch with me to carry on. So I'm looking forward to the next one. But Barbara Broccoli always comes up when we record at Air Lindest or CTS, wherever it was. She always comes up, makes a point of coming to, oh, Derek, very pleased you're on this one. We need you really? on the Bond films. Ruma, how come you're in this concert tonight? Well, uh, I know it seems a little unusual, but actually I was working on a project with John Barry before he died. It was a piece of music that he had written and I was putting words to it. And when he died, his widow Laurie invited me to sing at this tribute tonight. How oh, lovely. Well, actually, it was very nice because Laurie did say to me when I came off stage after rehearsal, she said... John really liked new singers, new musicians. Yeah, yeah. And um, that he would have been happy for me to perform. So you've got quite a few giants of music under your belt, in a way, haven't you? Because well, Bert Bacharach said you were the, that's true. the best thing. Well, he invited me to his house, and also yeah. he really liked me. I don't think he said that. He doesn't gush. No. I think musicians are interested in voices, I suppose, that just sing the song or just deliver the message you know quite mm. simply mm. if you're a composer that's what you dream of as a singer who just sings the song because you write it a certain way and the idea is just like an instrument the voice delivers it you know yeah. exactly as it's supposed to be with passion and emotion because I think I'm just a straight singer I'm not a particularly wonderful singer I'm just a straight singer that's kind of immodest right? <laughs> what is a very wonderful singer I like to sing the song you know I just like to sing the song straight yes and deliver the message, you know? The message is bigger than the messenger. All your life you've waited For love to come and stay And now that I have found you You must not slip away I know it's hard believing The words you've heard before But darling, you must trust them Michael Parkinson, you knew John Barry quite well, didn't mm, you? I did. He was an interesting man, John. I mean, I found it very easy to get on with because we were born a few miles from each other. We both spoke Yorkshire. <laughs> we had a love of jazz, particularly with Bedard jazz. And I found him very easy and very companionable. But he was a, a strange mixture, John. He was, he was essentially a lonely man. He preferred his own company in many, many ways. He was a tough guy, I mean, to work with. I mean, he would have his own way no matter what. You better not cross him because he, was, he could get quite short-tempered if he felt he was, wasn't no. getting his own way. But he was intriguing. And there's a melancholic streak in his music, which is you know, profoundly deep and moving and quiet and almost ominous, and, and that was in his character. That, that was John, actually. He was, he was a man who, when he looked at something, he didn't see a vision, he saw music. What would you pick out as something that showed that, that loneliness? In his jazz compositions, particularly, mm. I think that uh, one of my favourites is the music that he wrote for a, a film which nobody went to see, starring uh, Sean Connery, which he wrote a theme called Remembering Chet. And it's a beautiful example of, of John's melancholy 
nature, but also of his ability to write glorious jazz themes and Body Heat too. I mean, the thing about Body Heat is that it actually tells you the story. As soon as you hear the sax solo, you can actually, you didn't see the film, you know the story. That was John's genius. But then again, you know, it's, it's interesting too, isn't it, to think that the kind of film that inspired John to write Out of Africa and, and all those wonderful yeah. romantic themes, Dances with Dances Wolves, with wolves yeah. doesn't exist nowadays. There aren't any lingering landscape shots to write a theme over. There aren't any of those wonderful panoramic views and everything's now cut, 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 cut. So you couldn't write something as beautiful as that again. So in a sense, what we're hearing tonight is a kind of a, a saraban for a lost music, really. It's gone. Now, will it come back? I don't know. If it does come back, I don't think there's anybody, no matter how hard they try, will better what John Barry did. I mean, presumably there'll be something of those elements in the upcoming Hobbit film, because there certainly were in The Lord of the Rings. There are, there are the, the odd thing. We'd look at sort of a heroic theme, take Gladiator. Uh, yeah. that's, that's another that's one. That's a fantastic thing. It's a wonderful thing. Gorgeous. Theme. Exactly. But they're not going to be turned out with a quantity that they have been in the, in the past. I mean, most movies nowadays are the very different generation or a different market with the attention span of a gnat, you know, and that... <laughs> no gnat music. John didn't write gnat music. <laughs> Timothy Dalton, did you get to know John Barry at all? Oh, yes. I knew him from my very first film. It was The Lion in Winter, and he was the composer. And from the moment the screen... I think, anyway, the memory I have is it opens with a, an empty screen, a blue screen, which, in fact, is the sky, and two huge broadswords clash over it, and that music starts. dun 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 and I was shattered. You know, I was knocked out. And from that moment on, the, the film was a roller coaster. I mean, fabulous music, uplifting music, savage music, romantic music, brilliant performances from everybody. From everybody. I mean, and I sort of came out at the end shaking. I was wasted, really? you know, emotionally drained. And I sort of staggered off down this New York street, held onto a lamppost, thinking, oh, shall I be throw up now or not? <laughs> and all of a sudden, an arm came around my shoulder, and it was Johnny. He said, come on, let's go and have a drink. <laughs> what a fantastic start. <laughs> you know, and then we did a film called Mary, Queen of Scots together. He was the composer. And the first Bond movie that I did, he was the composer. He's a wonderful man. And that was The Living Daylights, wasn't it? Living Daylights, yeah. And did you work with him after Bond? No, no. But I, uh, I was just thinking tonight, the Albert Hall. I mean, sadly, we're here tonight because it's a memorial concert, hugely sadly. But also, we remember his fantastic contribution to elevating all the movies he was in. But he is responsible for me working at the world's two greatest concert halls. We did a big thing for him at Carnegie Hall in New York and I was asked to give a tribute and here I am tonight at the Royal Albert Hall. So, I'm not a musician, I'm a musical imbecile, but I love listening to music and I love the world of music. I would have never have had these opportunities. Welcome back to the second half of this very special concert featuring the music of, of John Barry. When I got to know John uh, as a friend, our, our shared interest was a love of jazz. He once told me, as, as you've heard from the conductor, that uh, his proudest moment was meeting Louis Armstrong, who of course sang with all the time in the world that lovely song he composed for the Bond film, On Her Majesty's Secret Service. John said that when he met his great hero, Armstrong took his hand and said, I want to thank you for thinking of me. His interest in jazz, fired by Armstrong, was hugely influenced by the Stan Kenton band of the 50s. Indeed, he took a correspondence course, John did, with Bill Russo, who played with the Kenton band. Now, those influences echoed down the years in John's arrangements and his compositions. So, two examples now 
of John's love of jazz. One of my favorites is John's tribute to the trumpeter Chet Baker, composed to the film Playing by Heart, and the soloist you will hear is Derek Watkins. But first, another marvelous example of John's genius to set the mood of a movie. The theme from Body Heat, with Nigel Hitchcock playing sax solo and telling the story. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring on stage the wonderful Derek Watkins.
Music there from Remembering Chet with the trumpet solo played by Derek Watkins. And now Richard Attenborough remembers working with John on the film Chaplin. I think John Barry has this extraordinary gift of applying his creative perceptions in isolation to that piece of material. He doesn't say, I wrote this smash hit, I wrote that smash hit, I will use that, I will fall back on that. He comes up with something quite different. I think John is driven in his creative juices by having a challenge which perhaps somebody might have not asked him to do before. I wanted a romantic theme, and a theme that would, when we required it, point out the poignancy of Charlie's emotions. Emotions of love, emotions of commitment, emotions of loss. The Chaplin theme came from the footage that Richard shot for the opening title sequence. The stick going on the back of the chair, the hat, the moustache into the tin, and then slowly removing the face of the tramp and revealing the real man. When you analyze a situation like that, and get down to the real nitty-gritty of what can you do with this footage? To me, the sadness just came out. And by the time he'd removed everything, it was like this Francis Bacon painting shot so close. And by the time you cut to his face at the end, when he throws down the towel, there was, to me, this uh, extraordinary, solitary, sad man and knowing the history of Chaplin's life too I mean you, you you weren't going in there ignorant of that but but it was just that last image after he'd removed everything that I just thought God this is sad John Barry is never satisfied with what he does John Barry every day that he wakes up believes that into his mind into his soul into his heart is going to come some magical rearrangement of notes and sounds and atmosphere which he is going to ultimately present and use either to entrance you in a concert hall or to contribute to a piece of cinema and it is because he's never satisfied and because he believes that there is still a peak to climb and that there is still a magic element to discover that he's a great movie composer. Here's conductor Nicholas Dodd and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra with one of John's most famous scores, the Oscar-winning Out of Africa.
you know, write scores if there is that sense of loss. And now in Africa there was. You bring your own sense of loss. It was loss of a country, it was loss of friends and, and um, just the whole atmosphere of World War II that one lived through. That uh, you recall that and bring it to things. And, uh, you know, five years is a long time at that age to live through a war. There's no way that doesn't imprint deeply on you for the rest of your life. No way. When I sit down and write, I can start at maybe 7 in the morning. And then I'll look at my watch at 11.30. I mean, I'm like exhausted, it's as if I physically went through something, you know. So it's, uh, it's the doing of something with passion. You never know what's going to trigger off something. But I do have total faith in the fact that something will arise out of the dark that's going to perk you up. And you never know when that's going to happen. You know when it happens. When it happens, you know you. Oh God, yeah, it's like it's like a gun going off. It's like, got it. And I'm doing my albums now, and I did the Beyondness of Things. I'm doing another album at the moment, based on John O'Donoghue's book Eternal Echoes. It's very much inspired by John's writings. There's a certain spirituality about it, but there's a lightness to it about it, and there's a kind of Irish whimsy to it, which is nice. I never thought you would be able to have that much fun with the priest. <laughs> I find my own mental movie, my own sense of drama, whatever that might be. It is a film score. I just don't have any film. <laughs> John Barry talking about his album inspired by John O'Donoghue. Now here's conductor Nicholas Dodd. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce an actor whose appearances as James Bond in The Living Daylights and as Philip II in Lion in Winter were both graced by John Barry's music. Would you please welcome Mr. Timothy Dalton. I knew John as a kind and generous man, warm and funny, and a man who could cut through to the heart and soul of life and of work and put his own heart and soul back into it with passion. Laurie Barry introduced me to the piece that I'm going to read. She told me that it was very dear to John's heart, that he kept it with him all the time, and that it was on his desk when he worked. May the light of your soul guide you. May the light of your soul bless the work you do with the secret love and warmth of your heart. May you see in what you do the beauty of your own soul. May the sacredness of your work bring healing, light, and renewal to those who work with you and to those who see and receive your work. May your work never weary you. May it release within you wellsprings of refreshment, inspiration, and excitement. May you be present in what you do. May you never become lost in the bland absences. May the day never weary you. May dawn find you awake and alert, approaching your new day with dreams, possibilities, and promises. May evening find you gracious and fulfilled. 
May you go into the night blessed, sheltered, and protected. May your soul calm, console, and renew you. Thank you. And now we have a performance by someone who, through his work on the last five James Bond films, has, in his own words, attempted to keep alight the flame lit by John Nilly 50 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, David Arnold. Some people, uh, when they saw Elvis Presley, uh, wanted to be a rock star, and some people, when they saw Picasso, wanted to be an artist, and I heard John Barry and I wanted to be a film composer, and um, so that's what I did. And it's terribly difficult saying goodbye to someone like John, because he's been such a huge part of everyone's lives, and, um, but in a way, you know, he is here, he's in the first violins, he's in the horns, he's in the trumpets, and I think he's definitely in the bar somewhere. <laughs> um, Laurie uh, has asked me to sing for you this evening, uh, and this is a song that was one of the last songs that John wrote. Um, so it's not something that I think anyone's really going to know, but it's proof, if any proof were needed, that his sort of elegant ease with which he can write a melody was with him till the last moment. This is a song called uh, Tick the Days Off One by One. Just tick the days off one by one Some days it feels these days will never end just to see you standing by my door Make the wait worth waiting for I'll take the days off one by one This is a love we can't recover from Fools tell you time goes so fast that the longing does last perfect love. I need to taste that taste again And tick the days off one by one Until tomorrow becomes here and now Quietly just like an answered prayer Turn around and you'll be there mm, Perfect love mm, Brings a different kind of pain It's a pain you'll almost taste I need to taste that taste Again And tick the days off one by one Until tomorrow becomes here and now Quietly just like an answered prayer the years of 
off one by one I'll take the years off one by one I'll take the years off one by one oh. I'll take the years off one by one Thank you. David Arnold.
<sighs> Marvellous stuff. Yes, well, ladies and gentlemen, our next guest is universally recognised as one of the world's greatest record producers, as well as joining the Bond family uh, with, his, with his thrilling score for Live and Let Die. Please welcome John's dear friend, Sir George Martin. What a wonderful audience you are. You know, I'm sure John would have loved seeing you here, and he would love to know that you were here for him. Now, way back in the dark ages, before laptop commuters, before mobile phones, before color television, and I'm talking about the mid-1950s, John and I were fledglings at the famous EMI studios at Abbey Road. He had just started his John Barry 7 very successfully, and I had taken control of the Parlophone label, which was a very small label within EMI. And I was knocked out when I heard his arrangement for one of Adam Faith's songs, and I thought it was terrific. It was audacious, it was wonderful. And other people noticed this too. And um, he was asked to write the orchestration for a rather nondescript tune, um, which the Bond producers wanted. And um, so he tackled it in his typical way, going right away off beam. He gave the tune to a very low guitar and used his high trumpets very, with discordant notes on the top, reminded me very much of Stan Kenton. And the result was startling, it was wonderful, and um, it became synonymous with the James Bond brand. And in fact, you can't hear it today without thinking of James Bond. I'm talking about the theme, obviously. And that arrangement um, pitchforked John into the big time because he started scoring all the Bond films. All of them were very successful, and he became a very much sought-after composer. Um, he finished up with the Bond people at the same time as Sean Connery did, and a new era came in with Roger Moore. And I was offered the job of scoring the Roger Moore picture. Well, John Barry is a pretty hard act to follow. And uh, I rang him up and spoke to him about it. He was very generous, gave me a few tips, and, uh, and said, you know, he said, I have no, no doubt you'll be better than me. He was a wonderful man. Well, of course, with his success, he was able to use large orchestras, which he loved. I mean, he used a lot of soloists with unusual instruments, but he liked to have a cushion of a great orchestra. And on one of his recording sessions, I walked in and I saw that, that he had 12 French horns. I mean, you've got five here tonight. 12 French horns, and they were all playing the same phrase. And I said to him, John, isn't that just a little bit extravagant? And he said, sure, but it's a great sound. <laughs> and of course it was, it was terrific sound. And he had this wonderful command of a big orchestra, but it wasn't that command that set him aside. He, the real genius he had was taste. He knew, had an unerring instinct for what a film needed. And of course, he used the very best of singers that we had, Matt Monroe, who I used to record, and uh, Tom Jones, of course, and when it came to Goldfinger and Diamonds Are Forever, he was probably our greatest dramatic singer of all time. A lady who is fortunately here tonight, 
and she is going to sing for us. And I'd like to introduce the incomparable Dame Shirley Bassey.
Coming on stage now here at the Royal Albert Hall, John's granddaughters who are presenting flowers to Dame Shirley Bassey. And there's just one more piece of music that's planned as an encore. The James Bond theme with David Arnold playing guitar. And from me, Michael Parkinson, it's good night from the Royal Albert Hall. This has been a special edition of Friday Night is Music Night, covering a concert dedicated to the memory of one of the greatest film composers of all time, John Barrett.